Good day, I'm the Brain Maber, pioneer field agronomist in the KZN area. Today we at one of our silage plots with Richard Fenter. He's a international silage consultant. His company is XI Unlimited. And we utilize Richard in, in all our um, trial and in silage trial um, evaluations. And but today I want to I want to talk about the basics of silage as a whole, and I want to ask you a bit of questions in your experience on, on, on different aspects. So the first question I have is um, what you're seeing towards the bad and, and good silage part of Yes, the brain. I think let's start with the good silage um, because that's what we strive for. Good silage I would define as being a silage with uh, harvested at the optimal stage. Uh, we can talk a long time about optimal harvesting stage. Mm. Um, it, it, it brings me to that second point which is the quantity because you obviously need a certain quantity to actually bring the cost down of your operation mm. and directly linked to that is the quality because you can have volume or bulk per hectare but without quality there's also no point you end up just buying all the nutrients into the system so those three things need to be in balance and then of course preserving silage properly is what makes a good silage so the way we get the oxygen out and the way we keep it out mm. so it's about good compaction or removal of oxygen if it's another system like silo bags uh, or uh, um, you know how we go about that process how efficient and how quick we are because the speed of it is also very important of removing oxygen and then keeping it covered with a plastic or whatever the, the storage form is keeping it intact and anaerobic for the rest of the period that the silage will be uh, stored. And then on the other hand, low quality. Um, low quality silage, I would firstly say, is usually cut too early. In other words, it's, it's too wet. Mm. Wet silage is a common practice out there and it's completely wrong. We have much higher fermentation losses, respiration losses, this is gas losses, which contributes to dry matter losses. Um, and also, it's a much more risky fermentation. We shouldn't be making wet silage you should give the plant time to mature. Uh, dry silage is another bad kind of silage. I'm talking way too dry. This is the kind of thing that happens if you can't get into the fields. It usually leads to a, to a poor silage because this silage just doesn't ferment that well anymore and it's, it's, it's more difficult to compact, etc. Um, what then links to, to, to both of, the, uh, of these will be the, the quality, low quality silage. You can look at a, just a nutritional level to see it's low quality uh, and low quantity silage, you know, low yield, that'll push your cost up. So mm. you look at the cost and see why is my silage so expensive this year per ton. Yes. That'll be uh, um, uh, a lot of times be because of the yield. And then lastly, poorly fermented and poorly preserved silage. You see this from a distance, unfortunately. Uh, sheets flapping in the wind, top layer losses, moldy silage everywhere, silage heating up after removal. Those will be the indicators of, of poor quality silage. Thanks, Richard. So I can add to it or just confirm that we've also experienced throughout our trials when we cut some varieties too, too early. It looks beautiful, the cobs and everything has, has formed very well. And then we cut it too wet and unfortunately the end result is just bad um, so we're not reaching the point we want with the trials at, at, at that stage so yes um, I agree with you on, on all the all the points there so the next um, talking point I have is what is the key or five key uh, focus areas that that a contractor or even a farmer can focus on when when making silage to get to the good silage um, goal Yes, yeah, so I think firstly it's different between a contractor and a farmer if you, if you make it yourself, you know, slightly different. But we start at the same point and that is with preparation. Uh, preparation involves the area, where it be it the bunker or the area where the, where the buns will be or the silo bags need to be prepared. Preparation includes the, the, the purchasing of technologies and, and, and sheeting, for example, plastic. All these things need to be planned and, 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 and prepared beforehand. But it also brings me to the second point of the mechanical preparation, which will be the machines. Machines mm. that need to be checked, serviced, uh, 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 make sure the machine can do what you require of it. And this is where the discussion with the contractor sometimes a little, is a little bit difficult in the quality of the machine mm. and the, the ability of it to process not only the plant, but the corn in the case of maize yes. with corn crackers, for example, very important for the overall utilization and 
digestibility through the animal. Um, that then, you know, leads us to harvesting stage. Um, how do you determine that? You, 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 we used to look at a plant from a distance. We used to look at maize cobs and, and the milk lime. All of those things are important. And it does give you an indication about you, you are getting close. But for me, milk line is just an indicator of how much starch has been formed mm -hmm. and whether we are actually reaching our full starch potential that the genetics can give us today. Mm -hmm. We need to determine the harvesting stage, ideally, by chopping plants, representative plants from a field, chop them fine and do an actual dry matter test on them. Yes. That'll be by far the most accurate way of determining what your dry matter is going to be and to get to that sweet spot of between 35 and 37 percent dry matter. And then the specifications, you know, decide how long do you want to cut this plant material and how well you want to process it because it also depends on the animal that is going to, uh, going to, going to utilize this feed. Mm. So we always uh, produce and process feeds like silage with the end use and the end animal, uh, you know, keeping that animal in mind. And thirdly, uh, Richard, if you wanted to share something close to your heart that you've been experiencing in, in the silage business, what can you tell us? I think completely underrated and underutilized today is the whole system of doing a proper feed flow. A feed flow or feed planning for your, for your business, for your operation, uh, has to start with what is a total amount of nutrients required in your system to produce whatever you want to produce that year mm. and then slotting in the different feeds uh, in those positions delivering certain nutrients because when you do a proper feed flow you start really appreciating the value of something like maize silage yeah. and also the difference between poor and good quality maize silage uh, if you're, especially if you look only at uh, quality the quantity will show up on the cost of the feed flow. Mm. Right. So I think feed flow is uh, completely underutilized. We need to put much more emphasis on that and that will highlight and pinpoint even the choice of cultivar. Uh, and that's where our, our, our trials with, with Pioneer is, it gives very handy data to really show you where you can look for the quantities and the qualities and the balance of that mm. to slot in nicely with that feed flow. Thanks, Richard. We really appreciate all your, your time and, and, and input into our, our practice and, and, and silage trials. And we're really looking forward to this, this season's cutting, cutting time and results that we're going to produce. And thanks so much for attending today and uh, have a good one.